always at the scene of the crime. I am Lamont at Large today. I am in Greenwich, Connecticut, and we're going to talk about the murder of 15-year-old Martha Moxley. Have you ever been in a neighborhood and you just felt that you didn't belong simply because it's just way too fancy? Well, currently right now, I'm in one of those very neighborhoods. This is the Bellhaven section of Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, Greenwich, in my opinion, is basically a suburb of New York City. You got a lot of these people who have very good jobs and they commute 30 miles each way five days a week into the city and they work for some of the largest uh, accounting firms, uh, attorney firms, uh, stock trading firms uh, in the uh, country. So Martha Moxley, at the time of her murder, was 15 years old. She was born August 16th, 1960. The a family was originally from San Francisco, California. Uh, before they moved here, they lived, I believe, in Oakland. Martha's dad got a really good job for an accounting firm and moved the family all the way across the country. So this must have been a big uh, culture change for Martha. Uh, she had only lived here about a year and a half and little did they know when they moved into this neighborhood that they would be very close neighbors to the Skakel family. Uh, the Skakels, a very well-off, well-to-do family. Uh, Rushton Skakel was the head of the family. Uh, he ran a company where they made Carbon Coke. Uh, carbon Coke is basically a cleaner version of coal, and that's what they sold. They used uh, Carbon Coke in a lot of uh, smelting plants, uh, making iron ore, stuff like that. And the Skakel children seven of them sadly the mother passed away i believe from brain cancer uh leaving a single father basically to raise seven kids on his own and if you ask the neighbors about the skakel family uh they basically were the prototypical uh rich kids that could do whatever they want they had unlimited amounts of money basically each kid had a credit card and they just kind of did whatever they want with it uh spoiled rotten brats come to mind let's go to october 30th 1975 you got the night before halloween and all these kids in this neighborhood, you have a neighborhood full of rich kids and uh, not much to do in Greenwich, Connecticut. So they had what they would call mischief night. Mischief night was when all the kids would get together and just cause trouble. Uh, they would go uh, toilet paper people's trees. Uh, they would uh, jump out in the middle of the street at cars, uh, knock on doors and run. Uh, order a large pizza with uh, anchovies and pepperoni and uh, send it to a fake address. Stuff like that. So that night, you had Martha and you had a couple of the Skakel children. You had Thomas and Michael. Now, of course, people's stories and... Uh, events that took place uh they get a little bit um a little bit uh dicey they get a little bit uh, cloudy but on the mischief night after they committed whatever acts that they wanted to commit thomas martha and michael are sitting in their family's car with a couple of other friends and they're just listening to music it's around 9 p.m that night and uh, the older Skakel kids, they say, hey, get out of the car. We're going to use it. We're going to go out and uh, probably do drugs. So they clear the car. Martha decides to go home. She, you know, lives pretty close to them, literally, like maybe not even a three-minute walk. 
less than 200 yards, I believe. So she goes home. Uh, Thomas and Michael, they go home, and that's it. Um, now, midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning comes by, and Martha's still not home yet. And uh, Dorothy, the mother, she gets, uh, she's getting really, really antsy. It's 12 o'clock. Her daughter's not home yet. So she starts calling all of the neighbors. Hey, have you seen Martha? Hey, have you seen Martha? She called the Skakel family. Hey, have you seen Martha? Oh, nobody's seen her. So she lays down in bed. She's thinking, you know, maybe one of her friends is hiding her. You know, tomorrow's Halloween. Uh, they were having the whole mischief night, th mischief night deal. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe she drank too much. And uh, she was known to sneak a couple beers around, you know, whatever. But by far and large uh, she was just known as a very sweet very beautiful young lady hey you're bored in uh, greenwich uh, you got a beer yeah sure and throw it over here nothing wrong with that i guess whatever your beliefs are on raising children so the next day 12 hours martha's been missing the police have been called uh the neighborhood has basically did some kind of a uh, search where everybody's searching they're probably searching these woods right here. They're probably searching this marina. They're going all over the place and nothing has happened. Uh, they have not seen Martha. Well, soon after that, one of the neighborhood teenagers is taking a shortcut in between people's houses and there's a wooded area that is behind the Moxley's residence. And as she was walking through the woods she looks down on the ground and she sees Martha uh, horribly beaten covered in blood not moving immediately she runs to the house and she starts banging on the door banging 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 uh, Dorothy answers the door and she goes she starts crying because I think she goes uh, I think uh, Martha's on the back of the house and she's not moving and then she's like just starts bawling her eyes out and Dorothy's friend goes to the back and looks at the body and of course that is Martha and she's dead immediately the police are called they come to the scene and they see Martha on the ground, she's dead. Just beaten up, bruised all in her face. Just a really horrible, vicious beating that killed her. They see a broken, broken shards of a golf club. 50 feet away from her body, they see the head of the golf club. She was beaten so severely that the head of the golf club flew off that far away. And they notice just her, her pants are pulled down past her knees along with her underwear. So they call for the coroner's office, medical examiners to come pick her up to do an autopsy after the autopsy is completed come to find out immediately when they got her body into the medical examiner's office they quickly determined that even though her pants were found down past her knees along with her underwear she was not sexually assaulted they did the entire autopsy and the resulting cause of death was bludgeoning and she had also been stabbed in the neck with the broken end of the golf club so that is what caused her death and now in this very nice neighborhood we have a brutal murder on our hands Murders like this uh, do not occur very often.
in Greenwich, Connecticut, especially in a neighborhood such as this. So after talking to everybody in the neighborhood, at least 200 separate interviews with any and all, they quickly found out that the golf club came from the golf club set of Rushton Skakel, the father of Thomas and Michael Skakel. Wow, that was easy. We found the murder weapon, and the murder weapon belongs to Rushton Skakel. And he has some boys, some ruffians, who are well known for uh, basically just being rich and doing whatever they want. Uh, I think this case is actually going to be quite easy to solve. So they talk to Mr. Skakel, and then they finally talk to the two boys. Well, they talk to all the Skakel children, but they focus on two of the kids. They're focusing on Thomas and Michael. Now, first they talked to Thomas because he was more of a suspect in their eyes than Michael was. So they asked him, they said, hey, Thomas, you know, where were you? What happened? He said, I was with Martha, my brother, Michael, and two of our friends. We were just sitting in the car listening to music for about 30 minutes. And then my older brother told me to get the hell out of the car because they wanted it. Oh, okay, okay. All right. And he said, you know, 930 came and, you know, I told her, hey, I got to go upstairs because I have a really important book report to do on Abraham Lincoln. This is a, you know, this is part of like at least 15% of my grade. So this is very important. So I got to study. I don't have, you know, I can't just be hanging out all night, you know. So they ask him to come to the station and uh, do a polygraph test. Okay, sure. I don't got nothing to hide. So he comes down to the station. He does a polygraph test. And uh, it, it comes out inconclusive. Okay. That's a little weird. So they ask him again, hey, come on down and uh, let's, let's do that second polygraph test because it, it came out a little bit funny. We, would, we just want to clear you, you know, we just want to clear you. Okay, that's fine. So they take him down again to the station. He does another polygraph test uh, and this time uh, he passes. Okay. All right, very good. Now, I'm not saying that they cleared him of being a suspect. Uh, I believe all polygraph tests uh, are not admissible in court. So they still got their eye on him, but okay. So uh, they're talking to the other Skakel kids, seeing where they're at. Um, but they also want to talk to Michael too. Uh, something is not right about Michael. Uh, he's known as a uh, drunk, uh, he, he does drugs. Uh, when his mother passed away, uh, his mood and his personality changed drastically. And uh, they knew him around the neighborhood of just kind of just being a kid with problems. So they talked to him, they said, okay, well, when your brothers went to go give your cousin a ride home, where did you go? They're like, oh, I went with them in the car. Oh, okay. And then what happened? Like, oh, well, you know, we went to drop the cousin off and then we turned around, we came back and we came back home. That was it. Okay. All right. So they're talking to other people too. And they're keeping their eye on at least a dozen different people. But so far there's no extreme hardcore evidence of who a part of the Skakel clan uh, had the motive or the wantings of wanting to kill her. Of course, you've got the murder weapon that belongs to the father Skakel, but uh, none of the Skakels are talking, and uh, they keep pressuring them about wanting to do more interviews, uh, more uh, uh, polygraph tests, and finally, uh, Rushton says, you know what, that's it. We're not talking to you guys anymore. Uh, call my lawyer. Here's the number. All right? Easy to do stuff like that when you make lots and lots of money. Another person of interest that the police wanted to talk to was one Kenneth Littleton. 
Now, why did they want to talk to Kenneth Littleton? Well, just by dumb luck, the family had hired him to be a live-in tutor for their children. He had just started that same day of the murder. So they interview him and he says, hey, where were you around 9.30, 9.45? Because that's when they're guessing she was murdered. They, they were guessing the timeline of her murder was around 9.45 to 10 o'clock. Pretty tight time frame, if, if you ask me, but that's what they say. So they say, well, where were you at? He said, well, I was at home. I was watching The French Connection. I love that television show. Don't you, officer? They said, okay, uh, did you see uh, Michael and Thomas and the rest of the kids? He said, yeah, uh, Thomas came in uh, around, uh, I don't know, a little bit after 10. Okay, uh, what about Michael? Uh, he Almost 11 o'clock, he came back. Okay. And they're saying, uh, anything else you'd like to add? Anything? Did you see anything funny? You know, one of the uh, murder weapons was found. You know, next to her body is the golf club from your boss. I have no idea. I just started here. Okay, so we're going to keep our eye on this guy. But for right now, um, there's nothing more we could really do except just keep interviewing people and what have you. The detectives have a pretty big smoking gun. They have the murder weapon, and it came from the Skakel residence, which is right in front of you. This is where the Skakels used to live. I believe they left, I believe in the 90s, they, they sold their property and they left. You got the murder weapon, but who killed her? Was it Thomas Skakel, who they're looking at? Is it Michael Skakel? He's a weirdo. They're looking at him. Was it Rushton Skakel? Was it the uh, tutor, Kenneth Littleton? Maybe a landscaper? This is a pretty big property. I mean, anybody can come in here and be a landscaper and grab a golf club, come back and kill her. Who knows? So as the investigation winds down, nobody wants to talk. Nobody wants this poor girl's murder solved. Time slowly fades away. And just from the other side of that area straight ahead, this is the former Moxley property. Uh, this is not the same house. This house has been rebuilt. Uh, the family sold and left many, many years ago. So she would have been found dead right behind this house somewhere in those woods. Very, very expensive house. Uh, this house is worth almost $14 million. Okay, guys. I just got kicked out of the area because I guess this is a private property. So we're going to leave the area so I don't get arrested. And we're going to go down the hill so I could talk a little bit more about this case. But, uh, yeah. Now, I just want to say this really quick. If you pay $14 million for a home, hey, you deserve a private little security force to kick homeless people like me out of your neighborhood at the end of the day. Have a good night. He's a nice guy. He's just doing his job. Okay. Let's get back into the story. So, after the Skako family, lawyer's up. Talk to my lawyer. Don't talk to me. I don't want to hear it. We didn't do anything wrong. My kids are angels. And the story slowly fades away. And media attention dimmers down and it just becomes just another not i don't want to call it a cold case but they're still investigating it but there's only so much you can do if nobody's talking now a couple of things 
uh, did transpire. Number one, in 1991, William Kennedy Smith was arrested and charged with rape. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, another Kennedy possibly about to get away with another crime. Those Kennedy boys, I don't know why they call the Kennedys America's first family because a, a lot of those people are really, really awful. So he gets arrested and charged with rape. Now he goes to trial, he pleads, he takes the stand. He says he's innocent, blah, blah, blah. He's found not guilty. Of course, the, the stain of being uh, accused of rape will always be a black mark on his name. But coincidentally enough, gee, uh, wasn't that the same William Kennedy Smith that was at the Skakel home the night of Martha Moxley's murder? Oh yeah, right, it was. Huh. And then people started asking him questions. Well, did you have anything to do with Martha Moxley's murder? Did you have anything to do with Martha Moxley's murder? And then this fervor takes place. Because of this rape, or this supposed rape, now Martha Moxley's name is in the news again. 16 years ago, 15-year-old Martha Moxley was found brutally murdered in the backyard. And in all this and that, the family's, the Skakel name, the family is getting drug in the mud. People are accusing Thomas, they're accusing Michael of the murders because they're really focusing on those two. So come to find out, Russian Skakel, he says, you know what? Hey, that's it. I'm going to clear my family's name once and for all. I'm going to hire uh, my own detective agency and then they're going to get to the bottom of this case since apparently the police out here in Greenwich, Connecticut don't know what they're doing. So he hires Sutton Associates. And of course the detectives for, or the private investigators more, I should call them, they start, you know, re-interviewing everybody that they can find. And of course, one of the people they need to interview again is Thomas and Michael Skakel. Now come to find out after they're done completing their investigation, uh, their stories change a little bit. Oh, okay, so what's so different about what they said in 1975 that changed up in 1991? Well, first of all, Thomas, when he said that Martha went home, that was a lie. She didn't go straight home. No, they were in the back of the Skakel house and they were making out and doing a little something, something. Yeah, that's, that's what I remember. Yeah, we, we, we did that. Yeah, yeah, I kind of remember that now. I totally forgot back in 1975, but 16 years later, my memory is a jog, so to speak. Oh, okay. Uh, that was the main thing that changed of the story. And let's talk about Michael. So what about you, Michael Skakel? What part of your story changed? Uh, well, you know, I remember hanging out with Martha Moxley. And uh, later on that night, after everybody probably went to bed, mischief night was over, uh, I climbed a tree and uh, kind of took down my pants and uh, I was staring at Martha's window and I started masturbating. So you climbed the tree, you took down your pants in this tree. Mind you, it's October 30th here in Connecticut, so it's not gonna be bitterly cold, but you know, it's, it's gonna be at least crisp. And you started masturbating. Okay, uh, must have been a part of a uh, mischief night, right? Yeah, all the kids do it. Yeah, you uh, you throw eggs at uh, cars, uh, you TP people's trees, and then you climb in those trees and you masturbate. The insanity of this story, uh, it, it, it's, it's really 
and truly unbelievable. Because of the renewed interest in the Moxley murder case from the William Kennedy Smith rape trial, uh, over the subsequent years, detectives kept uh, walking the beat, kept re-interviewing people, people's minds changed, and it took them a few years, but in 1998, a one-man grand jury looked through all of the documents, all of the proof of the crime. And even though the, the proof, in my opinion, wasn't very strong, uh, they felt that there was enough evidence. So in 2000, an arrest warrant was issued for Michael Skakel, charging him with the murder of Martha Moxley. Uh, he was arrested after turning himself in, but he was released on bail, half a million dollar bail. A couple of years later, he goes to trial. At first, he's thinking, okay, this is going to be a juvenile case. But no, they ended up moving it to adult court. And he went to trial, and he was convicted in 2002 and sentenced to 20 years to life for her murder. However, when you're a Kennedy and you got money... Uh, you're allowed to skirt the law. So in 2013, his request for a new trial was granted. He was released on $1.2 million bail. He gets out of prison after only serving about 10 years. Now, three years later, the Connecticut Supreme Court, they reversed that decision and locked him back up. So they denied him a new trial, locked him back up. He gets put back into prison but then a couple years later they reversed that decision and they did uh, grant him a new trial Michael Skakel gets out of prison now he's only served around 12 of the 20 years to life in prison he gets out again and two years later the prosecuting office says, you know what, we're not going to retry this murder case. So this guy did less than a decade, I mean, less than 12 years in prison for this girl's murder, and that's it. That's all he did. He brutalized this girl. Everybody knows it. And uh, it just goes to show you that uh, even though we have a pretty just justice system, uh, sometimes... Unfortunately, guys, it just doesn't work out that way. You know, we, we, there is no perfect justice system, in my opinion. And very sad to see a murdering scumbag get away with this crime. And uh, here is the final resting place of Martha Moxley. She's buried next to her father. This is John David Moxley. It's a sad day when a family doesn't get justice for their murdered daughter just because the murderer is related to a well-to-do, politically connected family. A family that's got away with uh, a lot. I'll just say that. Even though justice was not served for this young woman, rest assured, everybody out there watching this video, everybody out there that has read about this story knows that he is a murdering, filthy scumbag. 
And everybody that knows this guy in real life, they all know he's a murderer. Rest assured, the weight of public opinion will always win out in the hearts and minds of regular everyday citizens. Rest in peace to Martha and her father. All right, guys. It's getting dark. Got to hit the road. I'll catch up with you on the next vlog. Peace out.